Hello, I'm Butch Ravan, Faculty Director of the Brown Arts Initiative. Welcome to the Granoff Center for the Creative Arts. One of the Brown Arts Initiative's goals is to connect activist artists who work on contemporary issues with the broader community. Today, I am very honored to introduce someone who embodies that mission in a deeply meaningful way. Trudy Styler is an actress, director, producer, environmentalist, and activist who has served as a UK ambassador to UNICEF. She co-founded with her husband, the Grammy Award-winning performer Sting, the Rainforest Fund. This initiative has served to protect indigenous tribes by preserving millions of acres of rainforest. Styler has devoted her artistic career to a life of protecting the environment, supporting human rights, and listening to the unheard voices of marginalized communities. In today's talk, she will explore the intersections of art and activism and their impact on the earth and humanity. Won't you please join me in welcoming Trudy Styler. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Congratulations to any of you who are graduating from Brown this weekend and to all the families of those graduating. This is a momentous occasion for everyone and, and I'm feeling both proud and humbled to be the recipient of an honorary degree from this prestigious Ivy League school. I'm an actor and a filmmaker which means that I'm essentially a storyteller. As an actor, I've played many roles in fictional tales, but as a filmmaker, I get to choose which stories to tell, and that's important to me. As an activist for the environment and human rights, I've met many people whose real life stories are so affecting and powerful that they simply demand to be told, not least because telling them creates the impetus for change. It's human nature to love a story. We create and tell stories to make sense of our lives, to learn about other people's lives, to connect. Stories have the power to make empaths of us all. The young people graduating tomorrow will be looking forward to a new chapter of their own stories, to a whole new world of possibilities. Leading up to today and thinking about the journeys that they're about to embark upon, I've been reflecting on my own path. Is there a thread running through it? Something that makes sense of my instincts, my choices? Is there a coherent arc to my narrative? Well, I was born into a working class family <laughs> in the in the Midlands of England, one of three sisters. My childhood had some challenges. At the tender age of two, I was disfigured by a road accident. I was also dyslexic, so marked out as different. I got bullied at school, and I never really felt that I belonged. My happiest times were spent with my dad, Harry, when he'd take me to the farm where he'd worked during the Second World War. Harry would teach me about caring for animals, respect for nature, and how important it was to look after the health of the soil. And we would talk about what we'd do if we ever won the football pools. Uh, football pools, yes. The American equivalent would be winning the lottery. So uh, on Saturday afternoons across the length and breadth of Britain, families would gather around the radio to listen to the soccer results and see if they'd suddenly become millionaires. Uh, we, live in a rent we lived in a rented house in a rural area, not well off by any means. So what we'd do if we won the pools was an endless source of escapism and fun. For Harry and me, it was the pleasure of a shared dream that one day we would buy our own farm, we would raise animals and grow our own food. But at the age of 11, I passed the entrance exam that got me into the county grammar school, a fast-track school for high achievers, and suddenly I was thrown into a middle-class world of aspiration where education was valued and horizons broadened. 
And Harry, my dad, was very proud of me. But by the time I left school at 17, we'd grown very far apart. For girls from my street, university was certainly not in the frame. The future was not an exciting time of endless potential for us. It was a set of expectations, each one, it seemed to me, imposing just another limitation uh, on my life. Boyfriend, husband, baby, not necessarily in that order. Any kind of job to bring some money into the house. I had very different ideas, a dream of something more. One evening, Dad and I were on our own at home and we started to argue about what I was going to do now that I'd left school. He expected me to get a job in the local paintbrush factory, but I wanted to be an actor. In fact, I just wanted to be someone else to be somewhere else, escape the reality I felt trapped by. Harry hadn't understood how my departure into the middle-class world of a grammar school would change me. He didn't know who I was anymore or what I'd become. He'd expected that I'd be happy settling into the kind of life he knew. Uh, in his frustration, he slapped me. I fled to my room, shocked and outraged. Then with the hubris and absolute certainty of headstrong youth, I packed my bag and left. It was early evening and it would be dark soon, but I got myself uh, onto the main road, started hitchhiking. My destination? Well, I wanted to be an actor, I reasoned. Where better to start than the home of William Shakespeare himself, Stratford-upon-Avon? <laughs> it was late when I got there. I didn't have much money on me, and I certainly didn't have a plan. I'd made that grand gesture, but now what? I knocked on the door of a smart-looking house, realising all I could do was throw myself on the mercy of strangers. It was around 11.30 at night, and a couple came to the door, both of them in their dressing gowns. This was Hester and Henry Hawkes. Now, they might, might sound to you like characters out of Downton Abbey, but, but uh, they turned out to be my guardian angels. And I blurted out all of my woes. They came to my rescue. They brought me into their house. They gave me something to eat, and a bed for the night. The next day, Hester sat me down with a local paper and we searched for a suitable job. We saw a perfect ad. Help wanted to bring order to a lively and chaotic theatrical household, room and board, it, room and board included. Well, I don't think I was much good at bringing order out of chaos, but I was certainly lively, and soon I was staying with Margaret and Tony Church and their three children. They were cultured, passionate about the theatre, and the kids were full of fun. I was in heaven. I was so lucky to have found myself among such compassionate and generous people, thanks to Hester and Henry and then to the church family, the course of my life was changed forever. They turned things around for me and taught me firsthand that compassion can change people's lives. Well, by the time I was 25, I'd been to a prestigious drama school. I'd become a leading player with the Royal Shakespeare Company, as well as landing roles on television and in films. And my career went from strength to strength. Then I met my husband, Sting, and we had our first two children, Mickey and Jake, and I put my personal ambitions to one side for a while. We even bought a house in the country that was dilapidated but had land, and I set to work creating an organic farm. It was several years before I began to feel like something was missing. My acting career had been interrupted just as it had begun to flourish, but something else was gnawing away at the edge of my consciousness. I believe there is something in all of us as human beings that wants to leave the world a better place than we found it. And the greater our good fortune, the stronger the impulse is to give back. 
So it's around this time in 1988 when I was with Sting on tour in Brazil that we were asked if we'd be interested in going on a journey deep into the Amazon to see what was happening there. We had no idea what we were letting ourselves in for, but it turned out to be a trip that would clearly change our lives. So for five hours, we flew in a terrifyingly small, rickety Cessna plane the magnificent emerald green canopy of trees stretched out below us. We saw rivers, waterfalls, incredible beauty. We also saw vast tracts of destroyed forest. We saw smoke, huge forest fires, charred and blackened wasteland. We had no maps to follow and there were no real runways for airplanes to come and go. We were told that some of the indigenous were welcoming, but that others were distinctly hostile. So the pilot had to look out for a signal from friendly villagers to the flash of a mirror in the sunlight to see if it might be safe to land. The rainforest is beautiful, but not hospitable. Definitely not a vacation. A bite from an ant can put you in the hospital. We were not remotely prepared for the insects, for the humidity, or even the snakes. But, uh, but it is a privilege to be there. The scale is immense, and you realize you're in a very important, precious, if hazardous place, home to more species than, than exist anywhere else on planet Earth. On the one hand, there were indigenous people living in tune with nature. On the other hand, where loggers and land grabbers had moved in, it was a different world. The indigenous Shavanti people we met were wary of us. They wore filthy Western clothes. Children living near the scorched forest were covered in ash. They had no shelter from the midday sun because their forests had been cleared. Instead, they huddled into the school. The school was nothing more than a tin hut built by the Italian oil company, Agip Petroli, in exchange for drilling on Shavanti land. They'd been a proud people, but their naivety had been abused, their innocence robbed, and the most valuable thing of all, their trees had been taken from them and, and destroyed. 30 years ago, the rate of destruction of rainforests was the worst period statistically. It was said that uh, areas being burnt or um, were being burnt down at the rate of, uh, I think it was a football field a minute to make space for hacienda farms for cattle ranching. That first experience of the devastation being wreaked upon the Amazon rainforest had a profound effect what I saw was the antithesis of everything Harry had taught me about respect for the earth. It was environmental vandalism on a vast scale, and I knew with every fiber of my being that it was wrong. One of the most terrible tragedies of the ancient world was the burning of the great library of Alexandria, probably by Julius Caesar. Countless volumes of accumulated knowledge were destroyed and the wisdom of centuries turned into smoke. But the tragedy we face today is even greater. The Indians of the Amazon have no writing. Their library is the forest. Their university is the forest. Their church is the forest. Every day we destroy the library that has taken thousands of years to grow. Every day we're destroying the natural laboratory that could hold the cure for AIDS, for cancers. We're destroying the kitchen that tomorrow could feed the world. We are destroying the earth's lungs, the very air we breathe. In the Shingu territory of the Amazon, we met a charismatic leader of the Kayapo people called Chief Rauni. Rauni's understanding of his community's situation was very sophisticated. 
He knew that their experience wasn't isolated and he knew he needed to find a way to make people listen to his story. His plea was personal and powerful. He said to us, there's a lot of smoke. My people are very sick, but whatever happens in the rainforest today will affect all of you in your homes tomorrow. In the late 1980s, Sting and I knew nothing about running a not-for-profit organization. We were the most unlikely and unqualified couple to have got involved in this cause. But this plea from Rowney and the Kayapo people inspired us to start the Rainforest Foundation. I'm going to show you a little story of our first few years. We first went to the rainforest in 1988, at the height of the burning. And um, we were privileged enough to spend three days in the Shingu Park and met a very charismatic Kayapo chief called Rowney, who said that the forest was disappearing at an alarming rate. And unless we all did something that we had, we were in trouble. Within the rainforest areas that we're looking at, it's indigenous land. And uh, very often the indigenous people aren't doing very well there. My heart goes out to the Yanomami right now. They are the most abused, I think, of all the Indian tribes. Abused because of white man's greed. Our goal was simple, to persuade the Brazilian government to legally recognize and protect an area of Amazon rainforest roughly the size of Switzerland, the ancestral land of many indigenous people. We embarked on a worldwide tour, bringing Chief Rowney's message to the press and to the public. Because of all this publicity, we gained an audience with the Brazilian government to discuss demarcation and finally, success. There was good news for the Brazilian Rainforest Foundation campaigners today when they learned the Brazilian government had given the go-ahead for the creation of a national park in the heart of the Amazon. When you are committed and focused, it's amazing how many people are willing to get on board to help. Are you can sing this at the Rainforest concert if you want. I'd love you to do it. We're always grateful that people want to join us and want to help. One of the keys to its success is that it's a pretty eclectic concert. You know, we're very lucky in that the artists that we ask are always willing to have a go and do something different. So, uh, since 1989, I've produced 18 concerts at Carnegie Hall, bringing together some of the world's greatest musical artists to raise now almost $40 million to support some 300 projects in over 20 countries, as you saw, protecting a total of 28 million acres of rainforest. <laughs> Thank you. So our work, we help build health centers, we support children's education, women's cooperatives, we promote the passing on of traditional knowledge and we provide clean drinking water to communities whose rivers have been poisoned by the extractive industries. Most importantly, we educate indigenous people in how to title and establish legal ownership of their ancestral lands. The work of the Rainforest Fund protects forests, but its primary goal is to protect and promote the rights of the people who live in them. We're a human rights organization and our projects are always initiated, led and maintained by the indigenous groups themselves to answer the needs that they have identified. Sadly, our task hasn't got any easier since 1989. Indigenous rights defenders are frequently subjected to violent attacks and threats, uh, kidnapping, illegal surveillance, and even murder. In 2017 alone, 281 indigenous people were killed trying to protect their land against invasion and exploitation. It is a constant battle against governments and corporations who value profit over human life. My work to protect the world's rainforests began in Brazil, as you've seen, 
But I've also had a long relationship with Ecuador, spanning some 14 years and working on two distinctly different projects. In 2007, I went to Ecuador, to the provinces of Aureliana and Sucumbios in the northern Amazon, where most of the country's oil wells are. Uh, this is land that has been excavated for oil since the 1960s, resulting in 1,700 square miles of poisoned forest. Texaco, now called Chevron, had deliberately dumped 18 billion gallons of toxic waste during their time there, but since their initial token cleanup of the area, they've refused to return and complete the restoration of this land to a healthy state. I, I honestly don't know how the people who run that company can sleep at night. The population of these two provinces are quite isolated and very poor, but what I saw there was much worse than ordinary poverty. I saw rivers and streams that reeked of petroleum. I saw failed crops, dying livestock, and many very sick people. Rates of cancer, respiratory diseases, birth defects and miscarriage are all exceptionally high and are a direct result of drinking and using water that is polluted with heavy metals and hydrocarbons. I met Maria Garofalo, then a 38-year-old mother suffering from cancer of her uterus. Her 18-year-old daughter, Sylvia, has cancer of the liver. They showed me the stream where they collected their water. It stank of petroleum. The animals they raised to sell at the market just keep dying in the toxic environment. And while animals, people, and crops fail and die, Chevron has blamed the high rates of cancers and other illnesses on poor personal hygiene and sanitation. 30,000 affected indigenous Ecuadorian people have tried for decades to pay, to get Chevron to pay for a, a proper cleanup of their land and water. So the David and Goliath battle in various courts around the world has been well documented for decades, but as the fight drags on and the legal wrangles are protected, are reported in the press, the real human cost is forgotten. When I visited a health center there, I asked a woman called Carmen, how can I help? The answer was so basic, it was shocking. She said, Lady, get us some clean water. <laughs> Such a fundamental human right, but so much in jeopardy that it had to be recognized and enshrined by the UN General Assembly in 2010. Clean drinking water and sanitation are essential to the realization of all human rights. So the Rainforest Fund worked alongside UNICEF, Ecuador, and an organization called the Frente, putting $1.4 million into installing thousands of water filtration systems so that schools, hospitals, and homes could have access to safe drinking water. We got some pictures. Um, here we go. My first visit, though, to Ecuador was actually three years earlier, after I was appointed as UNICEF UK ambassador in July 2004, as part of their campaign to end child exploitation. Um, I visited some of the children living on the vast garbage site in Quito. Um, the stench of that dump site was nothing like I'd ever experienced before. It was a harrowing place to be in for even a few hours, but at least I knew I was going to be able to walk away. For the families that I met, there was no walking away from that nightmare. I'd like to show you a little clip now about a UNICEF project that changed those children's lives for good. Three years ago, we were doing a project with UNICEF called 
and child exploitation. This project was visiting kids on toxic dump sites. This is where I was three years ago. And uh, there were 60 or 70 little children that had been working for 11, 12 hours here. Um, in, these, in these conditions, with these dumpsters coming through like this, it's a pretty grim sight. I raised some money to help create this place, so they have a better time now, because they, they go to school and they play, and they get uh, three meals a day. She works in the garbage dam. Uh, the conditions changed. She says it is better because now children are not allowed to go to the garbage dump. Is it better? Is it better now? Te sientes mejor ahora yendo a la escuela? Sí. Yes, I do. I feel better now. And what, what's better? What's better? ¿Qué es mejor? Uh, to read and write. Yeah. It's good writing. Mm -hmm. How long have they been writing? Because they've, they've, they've got a good, good ability to write already. If they've only been here since December. Yeah. Much gracias. El beso, el beso. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to see them doing so well. Uh, working with UNICEF has been a great privilege. It's taken me to some of the most extreme uh, situations of hardship and suffering in the world and it might sound strange to call it a privilege but I say that because actually being there hearing individual stories took me from an abstract appreciation to a very specific and emotional understanding. Um, in Sri Lanka for example after the tsunami of December 2004 I spoke with fishermen who'd lost their wives and sometimes all their children and who were just trying to rebuild their lives. They didn't want handouts, they didn't want fish, what they needed was a boat. They needed to be able to start over. Uh, among the wreckage still left behind, the remnants of human life were overwhelmingly sad. The force of the water, 70 mile per hour wave as it hit the shoreline had pulled the human hair and clothes right off people's bodies. A little girl's dress lay on the ground, but what of the child who'd been wearing it? The reality of the human loss was brought vividly to life by these reminders. I visited Pakistan following the earthquake in October 2005 where some 75,000 people lost their lives. 19,000 of those who died were children. 138,000 people were injured and more than three and a half million lost their homes. The devastation was beyond imagining. Even hundreds of thousands of farm animals were killed. So the survivors were left with nothing. And yet the people I met in the refugee camp were so resilient I remember an elderly gentleman pushing a bike, surrounded by children, just about to go into a tent. I went up to him and I said, excuse me, how, how, how are you doing, sir? And he replied, in, in English, actually, well, I'm doing very well, thank you. So I told him I was here on a visit. Your visit means everything to us, he graciously replied. So is there anything you need, I asked. Your visit is enough he said, and gave me a radiant smile. He showed me into his tent. He'd made a home there. There was a place for everything. Everything was in its place. He'd been a college professor, but the earthquake had taken everything. Yet his spirit remained strong. Even with nothing, with his life stripped bare, he was holding on to his dignity, onto his humanity. His belief was, inshallah, it's in God's hands. 
There are many circumstances in our world where people suffering and their suffering will continue wherever they have no power, wherever their voices go unheard. And when, then, when that happens, there is a duty to speak up for them, to tell their stories. This is what motivates me in my work as a filmmaker. One of the first films that I produced was called Moving the Mountain a documentary exploring the lives of seven of the leaders of the students' demonstration in Beijing's Tiananmen Square in 1989. They wanted democracy in their country, and they came from all over China to be heard. Many of you, I'm sure, will remember this iconic image of the student blocking the path of a line of approaching tanks. And I first met Li Lu, whose book my film is based on, and some of the other student leaders in New York, six months after they'd all escaped China. Li Lu told me the truth of the night of June 4th, when China told the world that the crowds had dispersed, the press had been removed from the square, and then a new set of troops moved in. The Chinese government greatly minimized the number of casualties, and the rest of the world moved on. But at the end of last year, it was revealed that the Chinese government have always known that more than 10,000 demonstrators had been brutally slaughtered. The fact that moving the mountain includes some footage of what really happened that night keeps me still on China's list of undesirables. I consider it a badge of honor. But Li Lu, and the other student leaders had lost friends, left behind their families in order to escape, been put on the most wanted list by their own government. They needed to tell their stories to the world. Seven years ago, soon after Sting and I moved to the United States, I started a new film company called Maven Pictures with my partner, Celine Rattray, we set up Maven with the express purpose of representing women within the film industry, which is still such a male-dominated world. A report last year revealed that of the top 100 grossing films of 2017, only 8% were directed by women, only 10% were written by women, less than a quarter were produced by women. In the vast majority of cases, Men are writing the scripts, buying the scripts, making the films, distributing the films, taking most of the leading roles, and of course, getting paid more. The result? Well, the vast majority of movies are telling male stories from male perspectives for male audiences, giving jobs to male actors, and made predominantly by male crew crews. So at Maven, we want to hear women's voices to tell women's stories, to provide more rounded, <laughs> proactive. <laughs> to provide more rounded and proactive character roles for, for our great women actors, to encourage more women to find their place in the film industry, and of course, make sure that they're paid just as well as the men. So since we started Maven, two thirds of our movies have been made by women and we are committed to continuing that trend and improving on it because obviously women's voices must be heard. Of course, right now with the Me Too movement, we, we are at a turning point and it's no surprise really that this shift in dynamic between the sexes has come about from the deceptively simple act of women finding their voice, being brave enough to use it and not be silenced by an imbalance of power anymore. We all need to tell our stories. We need to hear each other's stories because stories, documentary or imaginary that convey some truth about humanity touch us and they can bring about change. Well, I'm delighted to have myself now joined the ranks of that 8% of directors who are female. I've completed my first feature-length movie, Freak Show, 
It's the subject of Freak Show is one that I relate to personally. A uh, young protagonist being bullied and ostracized at school, in this case, because he's openly gay. Seeing people like yourself represented positively in popular culture is vital. As a creator of entertainment, I take that responsibility seriously and believe that we must continue to lead the way in delivering messages of acceptance, validation, and respect. And we're all powerful people in this room. We're privileged with education, with shelter, food, health. We are the very lucky ones. We have the skills and the power to change lives, our own lives, other people's lives. There's a common assumption about philanthropy that it's born out of selflessness, but for me, I have to acknowledge there's also a deeper psychological driver, one that involves the self. Every so often, Sting and I go hiking in the beautiful northwest of England's lakelands. All you can hear is the sound of your own breath, the bleating of sheep, and spectacular scenery all around you. The mind wanders or sometimes closes in on a thought, makes connections, and recently I found myself playing with the connection of two verbs, to give and to forgive. I realized that for me there is a meaningful relationship between these two actions. By giving to others, I find a way to forgive myself. For what? A thousand things. Having so much, being so lucky, making mistakes, being human. We're all of us. We're all the walking wounded, gathering our guilts to ourselves like armor. We carry around our suffering. It weighs us down. And because of that, we are never free. My experience has been that when I give, I divest myself of some of my guilt, my anger, my sadness. It brings purpose, of, brings purpose, brings fulfillment. It makes me freer. And many of the world's religions, of course, are built on that insight. So in giving to others, I forgive myself and I give myself the greatest gift of all, acceptance of who I am, self-respect for what I know I can achieve. And I realize now that Harry gave me a gift too, that night of our argument when I was just 17. It was one of the most defining moments of my life, the moment I became the author of my own story, the writer, producer, director and leading lady. But whatever I may have thought most of my life, on reflection, I realize I haven't done all of this by myself. My dad's early lessons to me about nature, respecting and nurturing the land were so ingrained, so colored, with my sense of security and happiness when I was with him on the farm that they gave me a deep connection with the earth. He helped me understand my place in nature. He imprinted a message deep inside that years later would speak to me and guide me. He gave me an enduring sense of purpose. So, I might have left you, Harry, but you've never left me. Thank you.
We have time for a few questions. Thank you for that incredibly moving account of the extraordinary work you're doing. Um, so we, would you, you'd be happy to answer a few questions, right? Sure. Do we have time? I think we have. Uh, we have time for a few. Uh, there's something really important happening at 4:30 that we, some of us, <laughs> need to, to get to. But then there are a couple microphones moving around the audience. So, oh, there's a question right there. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, thank you very much. I, I didn't know any bit of this part of your work, and it's very impressive. So thank you for sharing it with us. I was wondering if you could say a few words about the animals that are also in the rainforest, if that is part of your mission. You mentioned the indigenous tribes, but obviously it's home to this broad array of animals that are affected by the destruction. Um. You know, I love animals. I, well, we have a farm. I, I, I breed dogs. I, I think that I'm a, 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 a lover, a great lover of animals. But our work does not actually include animals, although I've been you know, fortunate enough to see jaguars and wonderful rainforest animals and great beautiful birds, exotic birds. I came very close, had a very in close encounter with a snake, if you like snakes, <laughs> that uh, was about, um, I was asleep in my hammock, Sting was there, and we had sort of, sort of like indigenous people all around, and I decided uh, that I needed to go pee, and uh, I got out of my hammock with uh, bare feet, and I started to walk a few steps, realized I'd forgotten my flashlight, Grope my way back, picked up a flashlight, put on the flashlight, started to walk again, and my animal instinct went freeze. So I froze and I started to wave my flashlight around, and there, um, reared up about 12 inches from my toes, was one of the most dangerous and poisonous snakes in the Amazon. And I tried to, snakes are deaf, did you know that? So you can, you can like shout for a lot, but you shouldn't sort of like be very, you shouldn't move very much. So I shouted, Sting, there's a snake! <laughs> <laughs> to which he replied, what? <laughs> Fortunately for me, uh, some of the indigenous uh, leaders who were on this delegation must have heard some sort of tremor in my voice and they came around and sadly for the snake but lucky for me they um, they sacrificed him and uh, that and from then on sting and i were told by all our indigenous friends that that brave snake had come to give his strength for you so that you can carry on our work so i did take that very seriously as you can see I think we have time just for one more question. I'm sure there's no others. How did you choose Freesha as the one film that was going to be your directorial debut? Uh, well, I think Freak Show chose me. Uh, I was always its producer, and then we had a we, we had a director who, for oh. personal reasons, needed to take a leave of absence very much at the eleventh hour. So this is now July 2015 and we needed to go into pre-production by um, the beginning of September. Um, and as I would worked very hard as a producer on it, um, I, I asked my co-producers, could I be considered to be the director? And they said, well, we haven't got anything else, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I took on the role, and the first call I made was to the glorious Bette Midler, who's a great activist, and. Um, it's, a, it's an LGBTQ story, everyone, of a teenager who moves from his um, you know, liberal um, school in, um, in, in the East Coast to a more of a, let's say, re red state homophobic school where he's bullied and beaten up and he decides to redress the order of the school by um, him announcing he's going to run for homecoming queen. So uh, it's, a, it's a very charming film. Its narrative is 
very lively and amusing, but of course it explores some of these big themes of bullying in our high schools. And it's been a total pleasure to become its director. And then you can uh, download it, and you can see it on Hulu in uh, August, I think. <laughs> Free show. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I think that concludes the forum. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.